Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Morning. Very good morning to you. Morning, Paul. Very good morning to the folks who've not joined us before. Lovely to see new faces and hope you feel part of our worship this morning, part of our time with, uh, with our Lord Jesus. So you're welcome. And whilst we welcome Noel with, with quite a lot of vigour and verb and so on, could I just say to you, please don't tap his left shoulder. Because the operation that perhaps he's not going to have to have, if we continue to do that, he might have to have that operation. Hey, Noel? As much as he loves a warm greeting and welcome, please keep off that left shoulder. The second little notice we have is that next week, for those who are junior church teachers and leaders, can I just say to you that after the service next week, there will be a meeting, a uh, shortish meeting, well it's up to you really how long it is, a shortish meeting uh, after the service, after you've got your coffees and so on, meeting in that usual room. So just a little message for the junior church teachers and leaders. And so as we gather this morning, uh, a scripture really hit me this week that I, I thought we should share. It is one that, that, that I love, but then, like Paul, I would say it's my favourite, but then the whole of the Bible seems to be my favourite, really. But uh, I think you'll enjoy this one anyway, and it's preparation for our time together. It comes from 1 Corinthians, at chapter 15, and uh, Paul is writing that letter to the Corinthian church and he says this now brothers and sisters I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you which you received and on which you have taken your stand by this gospel you're saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you otherwise you have believed in vain we don't believe in vain for what I received, he says, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And then he appeared to Cephas, that was Peter, and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. And I'd just like to say to each one of us, he's appeared to each one of us. You might ask the question, well, why do we meet today on a Sunday? Why not yesterday? Why not tomorrow? I'm sure you know the question, uh, the answer to that question, but it doesn't hurt to have the reminder. It's because we celebrate that He is risen. Mm. Amen. He is risen. We may fall into the trap, if you like, almost, of just proclaiming that at Easter. No, every Sunday we proclaim that by joining as a church family to be with our Lord Jesus and celebrate His resurrection and be witnesses. We read about all these witnesses at the time. We are witnesses to the Lord Jesus that he's risen and risen indeed. Amen. So let's continue our worship. Shall we take up our offering and we'll have the worship team lead us in, in worship. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Hopefully you're ready for worship this morning. Uh, funny because uh, when we were praying before the start we always uh, pray as the leadership and as a worship team uh, Pastor Sean said um, it's a new day let's rejoice in it and I don't know if you remember that old song we used to sing um, this is the day that the Lord has made I will rejoice and be glad in it and I thought it would be good to start off by rejoicing in the fact that he is our Lord and Saviour and did die for us uh, I didn't tell the worship team this but we're going to sing it a cappello so if you know it, it's an old song and it's quite an easy one to sing, it's only a few, uh, few lines, so. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made, we will
day that the Lord has made. And we are going to rejoice, aren't we? Don't know your circumstance this morning? But let's rejoice anyway, for He is a good God. He loves us. And, uh, we'll be hearing a bit later from Sean about uh, God being a good shepherd. And He is a good shepherd. He loves His flock. That means He loves you. He loves me. He loves all the people out there as well. He wants to see them saved. So we're going to sing, Come, now is the time to worship, because we want to worship this great and wonderful shepherd.
uh, team sent to the Olympics as well. So uh, Hong Kong is one of the most densely populated territories in the world, with 7.4 million inhabitants in a space of 1,104 square kilometres. It's the world's fourth ranked global finance centre and has the seventh highest number of billionaires of any city in the world. However, there is also a high degree of income inequality and a chronic housing shortage. 54.3% of the population claim to have no religion or are followers of Chinese folk religions. 27.9% are Buddhist and 12% are Christian, either Protestant or Catholic. Previously, it was a British colony but was handed back to China in 1997 under the principle of one country, two systems and the guarantee of basic human rights for 50 years. Following a series of pro-democracy demonstrations, however, there has been increasing crackdown by the Chinese central government and since 2010 it has gradually limited the Christian community's ability to organise their churches on the mainland. So Lord, we pray for the people of Hong Kong that you protect their basic human rights. Father, we pray that you will prevent further crackdowns from the Chinese authorities. We thank you, Lord, for the work of Christian organisations working in Hong Kong, <coughs> St Stephen Society, founded by Jackie Pullinger, Asian Outreach and others. And we pray, Lord, that you would watch over and protect their work. And we pray for the people of Hong Kong that amidst their suffering and uncertainty, many would seek and find their hope in you. <coughs> Lord, we pray this in your name. Amen. We're going to continue our worship this morning by singing, Great are you, Lord. We serve a great Lord, don't we? A great Father, a good shepherd.
praise your holy name. We want to say thank you that you are our Lord and Saviour. But Lord, there's a hurting world out there, a world that's dying and crying out for a Saviour. And you are their Saviour, Lord, but they need to hear it. And Lord, I pray that we would be the vessels by which we can take it out to them. That they would hear the good news of Christ. The one who is the good shepherd. The one who loves all his people and never lets one fall by the wayside. Oh Lord, we love you. We praise and worship your wonderful name this morning. We thank you for all you've done for us. All you will do in the days to come. And Lord, as a church, we want to come together in unity and worship and worship and worship. And that's what it's all about. Whether that's listening to your word or just worshipping with our mouths. Because you are truly worthy of everything we can give you. Worship. amazing love. Oh, what sacrifice the Son of God given for me and for you.
that I might live. And I thank you that when that was written, it wasn't written with a question mark. I might live, but it's I might live. It, it's a truth. And when we sing about the lion and the lamb, we know that Jesus is the lamb, yeah. but he's also the lion. Mm. And you are so strong, Lord. And I just thank you. I'm not sure why I'm thanking you, but I'm thanking you that you hold your hand back mm. from pouring out wrath and power on this earth where we turn so many ways against you. We do so many things that must displease you. And so many things that must cause you to mourn, but you know the end of the story. And one day, the Lion of Judah will return. Jesus is coming back. And that's not a might, that's a promise of God, and you've never broken one promise, Lord. So we look forward to that day. We thank you, Lord, that in, in the meantime, you just love us. Mm. As, as, as awful as some of us are in this world, you just love people, and you just want people to see the truth of who you are. You're truly, truly the best, Heavenly Father, the best that there is of the best in this whole universe. And we want to, I want to worship you and Amen. praise you this morning. Because you're my yeah. Heavenly Father. Amen. You're my Jesus as well as everybody else's. And that's a personal thing. And thank you for everything you've done mm. in my life, in my family's life. Mm. Good, bad and indifferent. You've always been there, and I'm sure that's an amen, amen. from the rest of the congregation. Yeah, yeah. For you so greatly are a good father. Mm. Amen. Amen. Let's just pray for our younger members as they go to their activity now. Let's pray for the teachers, let's pray for the youngsters. And let's just remember that they go back to school this week. I never found that a wonderful prospect if I remember all those years ago and I'm sure that they have mixed feelings too. So let's pray for the, for the youngsters now as they... Uh, as they leave us. So Lord, we just ask your blessing upon each and every one of these youngsters. Amen. Yeah. And you know them by name, and you love them more than we can ever, ever express. Yeah. So in your love, Lord, we just pray that you will speak into their hearts this morning, that you will bless those who seek to teach and serve them, and that this may be a very special, precious time, we pray. In your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Let's continue our worship, shall we? Just before Sean comes and brings God's word, we're going to sing, Good, Good Father. You are a good, good Father. It's who you are. That's who he is. It's in his nature just to be a good, good Father. And we're going to hear a bit more about him being a great shepherd as well. A shepherd of his flock. So if you're able to, let's stand and sing and this good, good Father.
you, Lord, that you're a good, good father. Lord, we might have had great earthly fathers or bad or indifferent fathers on earth, but Lord, you are a great and awesome father to us, and we thank you. Thank you that you guide us, you teach us, you discipline us, you love us, you care for us, you died for us, you've done all those things for us, and we thank you that you are such a great and awesome and good father, because that's who you are. And you love me, and you love others, and you love our flock and our congregation. And you love people out there, Lord, because that is who you are. Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, the Good Shepherd of the sheep. And we come in the power and the presence of thy Holy Spirit. Yes, Lord. Lord, that great first chapter. Of the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans states that the gospel <coughs> is first for the Jew and then second for the Gentile. Yeah. We thank you Lord that throughout all ages but in this day and age you are calling out for the lost sheep of Israel to come back to the great shepherd of the sheep, Jesus. Amen. We thank you Lord that those of us who are Gentiles, Lord, not born from the physical seed of Abraham, but are nonetheless children of yours because we have the faith of Abraham. We thank you, Lord, that you have grafted us into that tree of life. And so, Lord, I pray this morning that for those who know you, Lord, that they may recognize in you what it truly means to be the good shepherd yeah. and Lord those who do not yet know you may they hear your voice today may they hear you calling to them that they may come to you and know your loving care your loving provision your loving guidance and your loving protection in Jesus wonderful name we pray Amen, Amen. Amen. so our text today is John chapter 10 verses 1 to 21. And the title of the message is Jesus the Good Shepherd, our Protector and Provider. Christ is calling people today to follow him. Christ is the only door and entrance into the kingdom of heaven. And I want to ask you a question. Are you following him? If not, will you follow him? John chapter 10 contains parables that liken the kingdom of God to a sheepfold where Christ is the shepherd and we are the sheep, the flock. And I want to give you six marks of the people of God, six marks of the Christian. If you don't get the chance to write them all down during the message here, you can watch the video later or you can come to me afterwards and you can write them down. But these are six marks of the people of God, six marks of the Christian. Firstly, that we will know Christ's voice. That means that he speaks. If we know his voice, he hasn't stopped speaking. I find it surprising when you find Christians who, they never ever say, but I've heard the Lord speak to me, or the Lord telling me this or that. It should be the mark of a Christian that we know his voice. The second thing is that we hear Christ's voice. Sometimes you may speak, but we may not always listen. That's why it says in the book of Revelation to each church, he who has ears to hear, listen to what the Holy Spirit says to the churches. The third thing is that, is that we will love Christ's voice. When he speaks to us, it's beautiful. Yeah. Even when it's rebuking us, even when it's disciplining us and he's telling us off, it's because we know that he loves us and it's for our good. And that if we set ourselves on the wrong path, he's trying to bring us back and draw us back onto the right path. The fourth thing is that we will trust his voice. When Christ speaks to us, we can trust him. And the fifth thing is that we will follow his voice. And why are those five things the mark of the Christian? Because the sixth thing is we know the good shepherd. Yeah. We know him who has called us, him who is speaking <coughs> to us. And so there's four marks of the great shepherd. And the first is he calls you by name. We heard it in the worship. 
God knows us by name. He knows us individually. I'm always a bit careful how I say this and who not to look at in the congregation. <coughs> it even says that he counts the hairs on our head. <laughs> An easier job with some, not with others. Go on, I had to go there. But um, that's how intimately he knows us. And Revelation 2.17 says that to the overcomer, when we stand in the kingdom of God, Jesus will give us a white stone with a name on it that only the person who receives it will know. That's how intimate, that's how personal the relationship Jesus is or wants to have with his people. He calls us by name. Why does he call us? Three things. He calls us to guide us. He calls us to protect us. And he calls us to provide for us. So there's the six marks of a Christian. And there's the four marks of the great shepherd. He calls us by name. He calls us to guide us, to protect us, and to provide for us. And the whole basis of Christianity is that it is possible now today, nearly 2,000 years later, to still have a deep and meaningful personal relationship with Jesus Christ, who is the very physical embodiment, the incarnation of God, the creator of all things. And I find it interesting that in this relationship Christ has with his people, he doesn't refer to himself, I'm the great manager. He doesn't say, I'm the skilled chief executive. He uses this metaphor, I am the good shepherd. And that's what we're going to explore today. The word good here is not morally good or being nice. It has a very, very deep meaning beyond that. It's actually a word, chaos. It refers to somebody who, when you look at them, you think that person is beautiful, that person is virtuous, that person is worthy of my devotion and I will follow them. It's a bit like when Melody gives me a chaos look every morning. <laughs> but, uh, that is the word. That's what it means when Jesus says that I am the good shepherd, that he is the good shepherd. It's somebody who is beautiful, virtuous, trustworthy, somebody we can commit to actually follow. Many of God's greatest leaders in the Old Testament, they served their apprenticeship in shepherding the sheep. Two of the most famous were Moses and David. A sheep are the most frequently mentioned animal in the Bible. There's actually 400 references to them in the scripture. And the figure of the shepherd has approximately 100 references. And often those references refer in both Old and New Testament to spiritual leaders given a charge to lead and to pastor God's people who are referred to as the flock, the sheep. As with all animal owners or farmers, there are good ones and bad ones. There are good physical shepherds and bad physical shepherds in the Bible. There are good spiritual shepherds there were bad spiritual shepherds in the Bible. And in the New Testament, there were good shepherds and there were bad shepherds. And so it has been throughout the age of the church. Now, before we get to our text, let, let me just give you a shepherd's equipment. Not today. Farming methods have changed beyond recognition today. But some of you, if I mention H.V. Morton in the Steps of the Master, how many of you have ever read that book? Yeah, quite a few of you would have recognised that. It's one of the old classic books. A man who travelled throughout um, Israel during the early part of the 20th century. And he saw a lot of the practices of what was going on <coughs> in the agriculture and so forth. And he wrote them down. And a shepherd would have a script which was a bag made of animal skin, which he carried his own food, bread, dried fruit, olives, and cheese. He would have a sling and some stones, and they were experts. When you're sitting watching the sheep on the hill all day, all you can do is sing, like David did, <coughs> practicing, or you're practicing with the sling. And they would just spend hours and hours practicing, and many of them became absolute experts in it. In a sense, we talked about the great faith of David when he went to meet Goliath. But David was an expert with that sling and the stone. He knew exactly where to aim it 
and he had spent many, many hours and days and months and years practicing as he defended the flock which was in charge to him by his father. They would have this sling to defend against wolves, lions, jackals, hyenas, and even thieves. But they also used to use it to warn the sheep, and H.V. Morton talks about this. He says he would watch the shepherd. The shepherd would be watching his sheep grazing. And if one of them started to wander off, he would get the sling and he would do it so the stone landed just a foot or two in front of the sheep. And the sheep would get startled and would go back to the flock. They would have a staff, which was a short wooden club, studded with nails on the end. I wouldn't fancy tackling a shepherd who had one of those. It sounds like quite a lethal <coughs> weapon. And he would have a rod, which was a crook, to catch and pull back any sheep which would go in astray. I shared on the prayer app a few weeks ago now that the Lord gave me what I believe was a prophetic word where he says, I am raising up my true shepherds to deliver my sheep from the teeth of the wolves. And I mourn what's happening in this nation. And I pray, Lord, where are the good shepherds you have entrusted to lead your flock? I don't want to berate any particular church leader or denomination, but do you realise that the, and I know somebody who wrote to him, they told me this, they had a response back from Lambeth Palace, they wrote to the Archbishop of Canterbury, and it was a Christian, and they asked him, why have you been so silent about this Olympic scandal? If it was Islam and Muhammad that had been insulted, you and the other church leaders would be some of the first ones standing up saying, you can't do this. But from so many prominent church leaders in our country, there's been absolute silence. You could have heard a pin drop when Christ in front of the world, in front of billions of people, was insulted. And the response this Christian got from Lambeth Palace was that the Archbishop has received so many letters asking this very same question, he simply does not have time enough to answer them all. A lot of Christians were asking this question. Lord, where are the spiritual shepherds in our nation? Why are they protecting everything else but Christianity? Why are they not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ? And that's the same in most of the major denominations, not just the church, of England, we have so many weak and cowardly shepherds who will not stand up for the good shepherd, but they'll stand up for everything but. In the Old Testament, God often called real shepherds to be spiritual shepherds because looking after real sheep taught them principles on how to look after God's people spiritually. Jesus said people are like sheep in need of a shepherd. And in the West, sheep are mostly left alone in a field to graze on grass or to drink water from a trough. When myself and Maldi lived in Northamptonshire, in the manse we lived in, we had a, it was a very rural place, and we had a farm at the end of the lane, literally. And quite often, sometimes on a Sunday, we would come out and um, the shepherd would be behind the sheep. You'd have one in front behind. And you'd have a couple of hundred sheep coming past the men's gates before we could walk to church. And we had to wait for them all to go by. And then we were stepping a bit delicately, as you can imagine, <laughs> you know, not to get our shoes uh, covered in, you know, you know, whilst. But I always used to find it a beautiful sight. And it always used to remind me of these spiritual metaphors. But in Israel then, life was dangerous and difficult for the sheep and the shepherd. In a land that had a fair amount of arid desert, the sheep had to be led to green pastures. The shepherd had to know where they were. And did you know, this is an interesting fact, a sheep cannot drink from running, running water. Because the way its nostrils are positioned, if it tries to drink from running water, it could drown from secondary drowning that the water can get up its nose and it can get onto its lungs and it can actually drown from secondary drowning. A sheep has to drink from still 
waters. Doesn't it help us make sense of Psalm 23 in an even greater way when we understand that simple fact? But to lead the sheep, a shepherd had to know where to find these essentials for life, to find food and to find water. And a sheep can only walk so far. They don't have great stamina. So a good shepherd had to know when to let his sheep rest. Okay, take a rest now. And then when they were rested, he would lead them on to find the water and the good pasture. Isn't that again a wonderful spiritual metaphor for us? Doesn't God say that to us sometimes? Just rest for a bit. Sometimes he leads us on and life is full of activity. And at other times the Lord says, I want you just to have a season of rest. And I'm not talking about physical rest where we stop doing the things of church. I'm talking about spiritual rest. Spiritual rest for our mind. Spiritual rest for our spirit and our soul. A shepherd would have to be vigilant because sheep have a habit of wandering off by themselves and getting into trouble. And I once had to question the Lord about this because it must have been 1994, 95. And again, I was going to the church there to preach. And I, this was actually the text I was preaching on back then. And that week I had a conversation with the farmer at the end of the lane. And we was just talking about sheep. And uh, he said, you know, sheep are the most stupid animals you can ever try to be the farmer to. And he said, they're always getting themselves in trouble. They're always wandering off. They're always doing this. Well, I thought, I'm not sure that would be an appropriate metaphor to use on the Sunday. But actually, that week, as I was driving past the field, I saw these lambs just walking in the road. There had been a little hole in the fence, and these lambs were just walking in the road, and I stopped the car and I had to pick them up and physically put them over the fence. And I thought they didn't even realise they were in danger. But also a shepherd would have to know how to fight because raiders would often try to steal the sheep as well as the wolves, lions, jackals and hyenas ready to pounce upon them. And that's why the title of this message is Jesus the Good Shepherd, our protector and provider. He knows how to guide his people. He knows how to protect his people. And he knows how to provide for his people. People. And we are coming to the text, I haven't forgotten that, this is a bit of a long introduction, but I think it's important to help us appreciate the beauty of the words in this passage. Jesus was addressing the Pharisees. John did not use chapters when he wrote his Gospel. So you have to understand that the words of Jesus are in the context of everything that had just taken place before. Remember in chapter 8, they brought in one of the lost daughters of Abraham and wanted to stone her to death. And the fact they didn't bring the man as well shows that it was a cruel trap to use her as a political trap. These were the people who were supposed to give spiritual guidance to people and they were using this woman as bait to try to trick Jesus. What does that say about their shepherding heart? How cruel is that? How have they missed the Father's heart? when they're looking at somebody as a political tool to be sacrificed to death just for their own personal ambitions. In chapter 9, they threw the blind man out of the sheepfold. They excommunicated him from the temple and the synagogue because this is the point Jesus was making. These Pharisees were bad shepherds. They weren't looking after God's people. And those Pharisees would have been well aware of the scroll of the prophet Ezekiel, where, and now we call it the book of Ezekiel, where the 34th chapter refers to the failures of Israel's earthly shepherds. But it gives a promise. Where earthly shepherds fail, it says God will raise up a shepherd who will be a good shepherd, one who will turn the hearts of his people back to him. And of course, that was a prophecy of Jesus. And Jesus himself said that he in turn will raise up shepherds after his own heart who will look after the people of God. You see that through his teaching and you see that through the teaching of the apostles. So let's turn to our text and I'm going to read the first six verses of John chapter 10. 
Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yes, they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. The Pharisees just didn't get it. And so Jesus begins with a parable about a shepherd who enters the sheepfold through the gate, and there's only one flock and one shepherd. The Catholic Church have misinterpreted Jerome's line in the Vulgate to say there's only one sheepfold, and that's the Catholic Church. That's not what it says. It says that there will be one flock and only one shepherd, and that is Christians. And he contrasts the doorkeeper or the true shepherd with thieves who climb in another way. And the shepherd's sheep, they will hear his voice, they will know his voice, they will follow him. I'm asking you again this morning, do you hear his voice calling you? Do you know him? Are you following him? His audience, however, they do not understand the parable. And an interesting fact, this is the only parable in John's Gospel. And Jesus was saying it, trying to get the Pharisees to think about the spiritual responsibilities they had. You may remember when the prophet Nathan went to King David, and it's in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 to 14. And he told him a story about a shepherd with a large flock who saw another shepherd who only owned one lamb. And he says the shepherd with the large flock took this one lamb and he killed the shepherd. And David was furious. He said, this man must die for this. My goodness, what courage of the prophet of God to point to David and say to him, you are that man. And of course, it was all to do with Bathsheba and how David had stolen Bathsheba's wife and sent Uriah to his death. And he paid a terrible consequence for that. But that's not the topic we're looking at today. But Jesus uses the metaphor of a sheepfold to describe the spiritual community. Because at night he would bring the sheep into a protected enclosure with a wooden gate. And the shepherd would leave a watchman at the gate at night. And sometimes <coughs> a thief or raiders, they wouldn't be able to come to the door because the watchman would recognise you're not the shepherd of the sheep, you're not one of the shepherd or one entrusted with these sheep. So the raiders, to try to steal the sheep, they would jump over the fence and try not to disturb the watchman. I think God is calling out spiritual watchmen today, again a very biblical principle, it goes back to Egypt. Those who will watch over the church and have the courage to point out the true shepherds and expose the full shepherds. And you do that by exposing the teaching. But when the shepherd would come in the morning, again, different flocks in the enclosure, when the shepherds would come in the morning, the watchman would recognize them and he would open the gate. And H.E.B. E. Morton again, he says, he says it's the most unusual sight because he said you could have hundreds of sheep just all milling about with each other. And he said the shepherds, they had this very strange, it's almost like each one had his own language. And they would sing a song. And as they were singing this song, he said it was the most strangest thing I'd ever heard. And each song was unique to the shepherd. And they would sing that song and as they began to walk off. And all these hundreds, or even in some cases thousands of sheep would come out the door and the shepherds were walking off in each direction, they knew exactly the shepherd they should follow because they heard his voice as he was singing ahead of them. He led them. 
And where he, was he leading them? He was leading them to good pasture, to still waters, and he was going to protect them on the way. Remember, Jesus is your good shepherd. He'll be your guide, he'll be your protector, he'll be your provider. He has a plan for your life. He has a purpose, something for you to do on the earth. He has a design to get you there. And he has an objective for the first three. Life's value is not its duration, but its donation. And when you follow the Good Shepherd, he has a purpose for you. Sheep at that time, apart from the ones which were raised for sacrifice, they were not really used for meat. They were used for their wool. And so the shepherd would get to know these sheep over many, many years. And sometimes he would give them a name like Black Ear, Black Leg, White Ear, Pink Nose. A distinctive of the sheep which he could see upon them, he would give them that name. Again, this is the image Jesus hearers would have known. But I think this is what he's trying to get across to us, is that he knows us very, very well. He wants to guide us, he wants to protect us, he wants to provide for us. Because the beauty of this message is, the real security of the flock relies on their relationship with having a good shepherd. He doesn't push or chase them, he walks ahead of them, constantly looking for the right path, constantly looking behind to make sure that they were following and that long had gone astray. And if they had gone astray, what would he go and do? He would look for them. He would leave the 99. And he would go and look for the one. And then he would bring them back. And the 99 would stay together where they knew they were protected. So let's just read verses 7 to 10. Then Jesus said to them, Again, most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And there is a sense that he was referring to Satan's threefold purpose there which is to steal, kill, and destroy. Don't forget you have an enemy of your soul. The Bible warns us about him time and time again. The Apostle Peter says, be alert, for he prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Again, a shepherding theme. The lions which would circle the flock, seeing if the shepherd was being inattentive, or if one was wandering off and then the lion would and take it. We have many warnings about the spiritual enemy of our soul. But when you're walking with the shepherd, when you're walking close to him, he cannot harm you. He cannot touch you. Why? Because the good shepherd protects you. I've told you many, many illustrations, especially in foreign fields when people have physically tried to harm myself or those we're with. And they can't. They found it impossible. Why? Because it wasn't my time to die yet. When it's my time to die, the Good Shepherd will call me home. Mm. But until then, Satan cannot harm us. That's what you need to realise, that when you walk closely with Christ, he will protect you. He is the saving door. Jesus is the only entrance to the kingdom of heaven, the only way to eternal life. The Bible narrows the way to heaven down to the person of Jesus Christ. He himself said it's a very narrow way. It's not a broad way. Do not listen to those who say there are many ways to God. There's only one way to God, and that is Jesus Christ. There's not two ways, there's not three ways, there's not four ways, there's only one and that is through Jesus Christ. And the abundant life he's talking about is spiritual fulfilment, not just material prosperity. And contrast this 
to the thief who wants to kill, steal and destroy, to the good shepherd who wants to give you good things. So let's look at the shepherd's sacrifice in verses 11 to 13. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But to hire him, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. What did Jesus say to us? I will never leave you nor forsake you. Why? Because he's the good shepherd. He's not a hireling. If our spiritual enemy wants to get to us, they have to come through him. And all the time we're walking with him, he will give us that protection. But he's a sacrificial shepherd. He gave his life for you and for me. So we're going to draw to a close by reading our, our final few verses. Verse 16. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. And he was talking about the Gentile nations there, which is being fulfilled even now. And he's calling people all across the world to come to him. Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. Therefore there was a division among the Jews because of these sayings. And many of them said, He has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Because remember, it was in context of everything that had gone on before. And so I want to remind you, when you follow Christ, walk closely with him. Trust him to be your protector, your provider, your guide. Receive the abundant life he offers. He's not going to lead you into a bad place when you follow him. He's going to lead you beside the green pastures. He's going to lead you beside the still waters. When you're tired, he will give you rest. Jesus says, come unto me, all of you who are tired, and weary, for my burden, my yoke, is not burdensome. Come unto me, and I will give you rest. I'm paraphrasing, but that was the essence of what he was saying. So Christ is calling people today to follow him. If you're a Christian, and you're only following him half-heartedly, give him that total commitment, because the Good Shepherd has your best interest at heart. He will lead your life better than you could ever dream or hope of. He will provide for you. He will guide for you. Have that trust in the good shepherd. Christ is the only door and entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Anybody trying to look to get into the kingdom of God through any other ways, you will not succeed. You have to look to Jesus alone. So are you following him? Will you follow him? Come to Jesus, the good shepherd. Father, <coughs> May your people hear what your Holy Spirit may say to your church. And Father, those who do not yet know you, may the voice of the Good Shepherd call in them. He who laid down his life for them and died upon the cross, to take it up again in the resurrection power, to ascend to heaven, to send the Holy Spirit upon us, his church, who still speaks to us today. May he, the Good Shepherd, who will one day return, May your voice be heard loudly and clearly by all. In that wonderful name, Amen. 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 Thank you for that word, Sean. As a newbie in the area, you may not be familiar with the Finland Sheep Fair. If you get a chance on the 14th, go up there, it's really interesting. It's loads of, yeah, there's loads of different, so you'll see advertised and see directions, so it's loads of different types of sheep. And animals in general, but yeah, mainly sheep, but it's so interesting. And it just confirms that we were at one point a very rural area in this area. But it's obviously got built up over time, so I would recommend that. Anyone else been to the Finland sheep there? That's great, isn't it?
Anyway, we're going to finish our service by singing, The Lord's My Shepherd, I'm Not One. The Lord's My Shepherd, I'm Not One. He makes me die. thank you that you are our personal good shepherd help us to listen help us to follow you help us to trust you more for each of those things in our lives that trouble us thank you for guiding us thank you for protecting us and thank you for looking after each one of us thank you that you love me that you love each one of my brothers and sisters here and that you know our name and that you want the best as we heard in that scripture for each one of us and we rejoice Lord that you don't give second best you give best may we rejoice as we leave this place this morning having been in your presence that your presence will go with us during this coming week and that we will know and experience more the truth that you are the Good Shepherd. Yes. Amen. Amen.